children struggling every day with ADHD? Scott's allergies made it hard to keep up with his friends. Allergic reactions from accidental food exposure. Moderate to severe eczema. Plaque psoriasis. Rheumatoid arthritis. Food allergies. Allergies. Seizure. Asthma. Eczema. IBS. Lupus. We are now the sickest country in the world. The health of American children is in crisis. A huge rise in chronic conditions in kids 17 and under. More than 40% of American children now have at least one chronic health condition. Autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile diabetes, lupus, Crohn's disease, all this IBS. I had eczema, asthma, all put out. Allergies, stomach issues. This is to me the one that gets me. Just a few decades ago, one in 10,000 children had autism. Today it's one in 31. ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, text, Tourette syndrome, narcolepsy, sleep disorders, ASD, autism. But there's no way in the world that these kind of rapid increases in the incidence of disease could be genetic. Genetic change takes generations, centuries to play out. What's really causing our kids of this generation to be so chronically sick? What the heck is happening? America is the sickest nation in the industrialized world. It is now believed that over 54% of our kids have a chronic disease, either a neurological disorder or an autoimmune disease. That's up from only 12.8% back in the 1980s. In roughly 40 years, we have seen the greatest decline in human health ever recorded. What if I told you there is a study that could shed light on this chronic disease epidemic, but no major medical institution seemed willing to do it. What if I told you there was one scientist brave enough to conduct this study? How you doing, Mark? Good to see you. Hey, nice to see you. Absolutely. What if I told you that when the study was finished, that scientist was too afraid to publish it? What would you do? Maybe you would do what I did. I got hidden cameras and recording equipment and I went to ask him why. Thank you. You're very welcome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you all dined with us before. I want to show you a video. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm thinking before we get into the hidden cameras and the study and Dr. Zervos and all that, why don't we just take it all the way back to how this actually started? I've been a medical journalist for almost 20 years now. My first 10 years was at CBS, and the last eight years or so, I've had my internet news show called The High Wire. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you but are. But the biggest change in my career happened when I produced a documentary about vaccinations called Vaxxed. And at the center of that documentary was a whistleblower from the CDC named Dr. William Thompson. He came forward in 2015 and said that they were committing scientific fraud on the vaccine safety studies. Well, that film blew up and became a worldwide sensation, mostly because we got so much bad press, starting with being kicked out of the Tribeca Film Festival. The decision to run a controversial documentary about vaccines has Robert De Niro at the center of a big screen backlash. 
Tonight, the film festival Robert De Niro started under fire, a controversial new film that many are characterizing as anti-vaccine. I think the movie is something to, that people should see. There was a backlash which I haven't fully explored. I want to know the truth, and I'm not anti-vaccine. I want safe vaccines. Vax producer Del Bigtree says canceling the screening amounts to a suppression of the truth. I can't imagine what type of pressure came down that would make them pull a movie that they were obviously behind in the beginning? The message from the medical community is clear. This is one of those scientific questions that where science has provided an answer. Vax ended up being one of the most controversial documentaries in history. And because of that, there were lines down the block everywhere we went. Look at this crowd behind me. Look at this line. It goes on and on and on. In fact, the very first day we screened at Angelica Film Center in New York, I wanted to know why there's this giant line down the block. What are these people here for? Can every parent or someone, you know, if you have a family member with autism, would you please stand up right now? Like, see? Three quarters of the room stood up. I remember feeling like the air just got sucked out of the room. I had no idea that there was this many people suffering from this issue. I ended up asking that question three screenings a day, five days a week for an entire year. And every single time, three quarters of the room stood up. I realized I had stumbled on something absolutely massive. Hello everybody, this is Jamie. Jamie's first, she's in Can you guys both tell us your names? I'm Stephanie. And this is Zion. Zion. After the screenings, parents of injured children were inspired to tell their own stories. We set up video cameras and started interviewing everybody that wanted to talk. And what I discovered is it wasn't just autism and it wasn't just the MMR vaccine. There was an ocean of vaccine injury and nobody was talking about it. Doctor says, well, do you want the flu vaccine? And I was like, might as well do it now. I gave in, I did polio. I gave her the Hep B Vax. She got the two month shots. Detail. The MMR vaccine. By 10.30 that morning, um, I was like, oh my gosh. She was arching her back, clenching her fists. I didn't think I was gonna cry. That night we were in the hospital with the 106 degree fever. He began to projectile vomit. He began to this loud pitch scream. Like that's when the blood curdling scream started. I did not lay down for 10 months straight um, because she would, she would vomit and asphyxiate. She would vomit at night and she would lie there while she was asleep and she would choke on it. When we had that vaccination, he lost all language. He just stopped talking? He wasn't talking. He didn't want to nurse. He went to not talking at all. He was developing really well, except for motor skills. He's got chronic allergies. An eczema rash. Food protein enterocolitis syndrome. She couldn't eat anything on the glycemic index that was too high. GI symptoms, he started to have gut inflammation. Chronic snoring. Oh, yeah. Sleep apnea. Seizure-like activity. We woke up, she just <laughs> she died in your arms. Yeah. I continued to vaccinate her and make her worse and make her sicker. The guilt and the, it's so overwhelming. They killed my daughter. Clearly this was a bigger issue than anybody realized. But there was one particular interview that we did that really changed my perspective forever. Colton was a 13-year-old healthy, strong boy. He loved anything that has to do with an adrenaline rush. Motocross was his passion. The doctor says, hey, he's the age that uh, you should get the HPV vaccine. I said, uh, okay. So he was administered the, the vaccine. And then this is the last day he got to ride that big boy bike. And that day he came home, he was starting to feel nauseous really sore neck. He still didn't want to get out of bed. I just thought, man, you're just really weak and exhausted. And uh, that evening, uh, when he sat up to take a, a drink of water, he just flopped back and his, his head just hit the pillow. And I went, Colton, are you going paralyzed? They immediately took him down to Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake. Original diagnosis was transverse myelitis. When the doctor came out and asked me, has he been sick? I said, no, he hasn't been sick. He had the HPV vaccine on February 1st. And they went, 
Oh. Well, um, we'll be reporting that to VARS. It does suck, like, not being able to play sports anymore. Um, so now I have to sit on the sideline, just watch everybody. <laughs> you gotta do your research, like, you don't, you can't just trust a doctor anymore. You did your own ways to find out what's best for you. Unfortunately, Colton ended up taking his life in 2018 because he believed he'd become too much of a burden on his family. But the thing I remember about standing there and watching that interview taking place, my co-producer Polly Tommy was doing the interview, was this box that was hanging on his side that was breathing for him. And it went through a tube that was going through a hole in his throat. And he literally had to wait for it to fill his lungs with air before he could answer a question. So he'd go and then he would start answering the question until he ran out of air. I thought about all of the people that accused these so-called anti-vaxxers of bringing back polio or the iron lung. Once vaccination rates fall, you're gonna have a lot of people getting sick and a lot of children paralyzed for the rest of their life with polio. I thought, he's wearing an iron lung. You're not laying in a metal tube anymore. They've reduced it down to a box that hangs on your side and a hose that goes to your throat. But in this case, he wasn't paralyzed because he had polio. He wasn't paralyzed because he didn't vaccinate. He was paralyzed by the Gardasil HPV vaccine. I chose to get my daughter vaccinated because I want her to be one less woman affected by cervical cancer. One less Gardasil. Then I went home and started looking up all of the inserts, the warning labels that are wrapped around all the childhood vaccines. And most of them say it right there in serious adverse events. Guillain-Barre syndrome, that's paralysis. Or transverse myelitis, paralysis. And I realized the polio vaccine is a success. we didn't eradicate paralytic diseases with the vaccine program. The vaccine works. We're causing paralytic diseases with our vaccine program. So as we traveled the country, some parents would come up and say, I'm about to have a baby. I'm definitely not going to get the MMR vaccine because your movie shows that that one's dangerous. But what about the other 16 vaccines that are given in 72 doses by the time my child's 18? And I'd say, I only have anecdotal evidence from the thousands of interviews I've done that not a single childhood vaccine is safe. But that's not scientific. I wanted something better. I wanted to get to the bottom of this. So I started a nonprofit called the Informed Consent Action Network. Based on the Nuremberg Code's right to voluntary consent, the, German Air Force. the ethical principle globally agreed upon in the wake of the Nazi doctor's horrifying human experiments, of inmates concentration camps for experimental purposes. where it states, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. And there should be no element to force, fraud, deceit, duress, or overreaching or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. What I wanted to do was investigate the entire vaccine program. I was really focused on one thing. We hear that vaccines are safe, 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 safe and effective. 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 But before we even worry about if they're effective, how did we determine they're safe? We started looking at all the science around the world, but we hit a big roadblock. You can't sue a manufacturer of a vaccine. It's one of the only products in America that has what they call liability protection. The reason is because of a law that was passed in 1986 by the US government. The pharmaceutical industry basically blackmailed the government. And they said, we are losing so much money from lawsuits for death and injury from our vaccines, we can't make a profit. Studies have shown that the whooping cough or pertussis vaccine causes brain damage. The controversy isn't really over the fact that it happens, but how often it happens. And they said, if you want us to continue making vaccines, you're going to have to take on the liability. And our government agreed to that. If you want to sue or you want to get any information outside of what's publicly known, you're going to have to sue the government. And that's when I realized I need a constitutional attorney. And I found a guy named Aaron Seary. Mr. Siri, you're not.